Welcome to Nuances Beyond First Impressions with the Asian Diaspora. I'm Ariana Milla, a Filipino American from a small town on the southern border in Texas. I'm Sherilyn Lee, a new American with Chinese Mauritian roots. Together, we wanted to create a safe space where everyone feels welcome to learn more about the AAPI community. We hope that through the personal stories we'll hear, we'll all get a glimpse of the humanity behind the stereotypes, how we have so much in common in some ways and so little in other ways. Before we get into our conversation with Edmund, we have a few terms that we'd like to define. Ableism is the discrimination in favor of able-bodied people. Hashtag Pride Out is a protest against the TikTok algorithm being used to silence LGBTQIA plus creators in which creators use the gesture of a hand over their mouth to symbolize being silenced. However, this gesture is used by the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit movement. Duet Stitch features on TikTok is to create a video in combination with another TikTok video. And finally, model minority is a stereotype and myth that characterizes Asian Americans as a polite, law-abiding group who have achieved a higher level of success than the general population through some combination of innate talent and work ethic. However, this myth is harmful and does not take into account all Asian ethnic groups. Today we are here with Edmund Chan. Corpus Christi, Texas native Edmund Chan is a historical violinist who performs with many early music ensembles and orchestras in the United States, Europe, and Hong Kong. Edmund completed his master's degree in historical violin at the HKU Utrecht Conservatorium in the Netherlands. His master's thesis entitled The Fashionable Violinist, Fashion and How to Hold the Violin in the 17th and 18th Centuries, focused on exploring historical clothing and historical violin technique. He also completed an artist certificate in Baroque violin at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague. Edmund teaches historical violin and viola at the University of Pennsylvania as a private lessons instructor and has lectured on historical clothing to audiences in both the U.S. and in the Netherlands. In his free time, Edmund enjoys cooking, swimming, running, going on bike rides, and playing board, card, or computer games with friends and family. Edmund, thank you so much for being here. It's great to see a fellow South Texan on the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is a wild career you've had. <laughs> yeah. Life has been such a roller coaster ride for me. I've not had a dull moment ever. Tell us a little bit about this non traditional career that you've built. It came out of nowhere. So, a little bit of backstory. When I was in pharmacy school, I was the victim of a hate crime on campus. And I can talk about that a little bit later. But basically, because of the mental stress that that put me under, the second year of pharmacy school, I ended up failing one section of therapeutics. And the school made me redo the entire year to make up that one block. The mental strain that I was under, along with PTSD type symptoms Mm -hmm. and reactions to things, I should have taken a year off to just get away from the situation. But I ended up not being able to make it through that one unit, and they removed me from the program. When that happened, I met the artistic directors for the Baroque Orchestra that I play in now at a summer music festival. Going into that festival, I saw that they were going to be there and that their concert master was going to be giving master classes every day. So I was like, okay, perfect opportunity. I've been practicing. I have not stopped practicing my violin. I showed up at that festival with six different violin sonatas ready to play. And I waited till about 15 minutes before the master class to see if anybody signed up to play. And inevitably, every day, nobody signed up to play. <laughs> so. I signed up. I played through all six violin sonatas for the concert master and got lessons on them during the week. And he went to the artistic directors and was like, hey, have you seen this guy? I've talked with him. I I told them about what had happened. And eventually they invited me out to Philadelphia to fill in a spot for somebody that needed a sub. And they said, hey, if you are ever out on the East Coast, you can do this. You are a capable musician. If this is what you want to do for your career, maybe you should move out here and get set up. And I did it. It was a huge leap of faith into the unknown of transitioning from a science career path into a music career. Let me just close my eyes and just jump. (laughs) And I did. It has been crazy fun, heartbreaking, and all of the above. And I love what I do. That's amazing. That is so cool. Thank you. (laughs) How was that with your family? It was difficult. When dealing with the hate crime, in true Asian or Chinese fashion, my parents were like, put your head down, work harder, 
don't let them get to you and don't make any waves. Yeah. Now, and they also were like, do you need to come home? Do you need to not be there? And I am the type of person that when you try to silence my voice or when you try to keep me quiet, I will push back because I'm a fighter. Even if my parents are telling me, put your head down, get through this, finish the program, I will still speak up. And for them, it was difficult to watch me join the LGBTQIA plus support group at school, which was newly reformed after the hate crime. Joining that, speaking up, and I was angry. It w- was difficult for them to watch that. As far as being gay in my family, we don't really talk about it. I think my sister-in-law, she's not Asian. She is the one person that will ask about aspects from that side of who I am. And we'll have conversations or we have had conversations in the past. But my family in general, they accept me for who I am, but it's also unspoken. Yeah. Yeah. The times that I go back to Hong Kong to visit family, if they ask, oh, where's your girlfriend? I just say, oh, there is no girlfriend. Yeah. Because I know that my parents are not going to bring that up with extended family. Mm. And I'm not there often enough to justify creating any kind of strife within the family because I am gay. Yeah. And so everybody deals with it in their own way. This is how I'm choosing to deal with it because it's just not worth it for their peace of mind, for my peace of mind. Yeah. If it gets to the point where I am ever in a relationship and that partner goes with me to Hong Kong, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Yeah. yeah. But for now, it's just easier for everybody. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. How did your family react to you going into music? Were they happy about that? They all questioned it. (laughs) I'm sure they all thought that I was crazy. (laughs) The first year that I was here in Philadelphia, my mom actually came out for one of the last concert sets. So she was able to come to rehearsals, meet all of my colleagues and friends, and just see what it means to be a professional musician. And that changed her opinion on all of it because she realized, oh, you guys actually do like full six hour days of rehearsal. You know the music before you even get there. So there's a lot of practicing that goes into that, which she knows that I've been playing my violin since I was two and a half. She knows that there's a lot of work that goes into being a musician, but her coming to see that and see me in the actual job helped change her perceptions. And in true Chinese fashion, we all have family discussions about everything that we do. And I'm sure that was then a conversation that she had with my siblings and my dad. And so that information was then dispersed out. To them. <laughs> <laughs> because even getting our tires changed when I was an undergrad, it would always turn into, hey, dad, I think it's time. Oh, did you go to Delta Tire? Did you go to Sam's Club? Did you go to Walmart? You need to make sure. And then my brother's calling and saying, what about this place? And what about that place? And it's a family discussion to get my tires changed. Guys, I just need to get it done. (laughs) And I'm the youngest too. I had the youngest son. So it's like, what do they tell me to do? Okay, go do that. Also going into music is what I want to do. And my entire life, I always take into consideration what's best for the family, what's best for what's best for my community which is my family so a lot of decisions that i've made in my life have been for that yeah i think going into music was one of the first true decisions that i got to make for myself yeah which is why i'm fighting so hard for it to keep going yeah that was the same for me (laughs) (laughs) it's scary isn't it when it's the Mm -hmm. first time that you're doing something it feels selfish you're doing it only for yourself yes exactly Exactly. And you have to work through that and come to the realization that, no, it's not selfish. Right. I get to be happy in the career of my choice. And if that career happens to be something that I absolutely love doing, all the better. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's hard to associate something that makes you happy as something that's okay to have. In my family, too, we just grew up with this idea that life is hard, life sucks, we have to do lots of things we don't want to do. And anything that makes us happy, that's something that's selfish. You have to do what's best for other people. Getting to that point where you don't feel guilty about doing something that makes you happy, I think that's hard. Yeah. This leads into my going back to school to get my master's. Because I did this late. I had auditioned at so many schools in the U.S. From the time that I moved to Philadelphia until I left to go to the Netherlands, it was just rejection after rejection. Or 
the one school that let me in, because it was for an artist certificate and not for a full master's degree, they wouldn't offer me financial aid. And so when I got into the school in the Netherlands, I told my parents, you know what, I think this is something that I just have to do for myself. It took a lot of effort for me to even say those words. And then when the rest of the family found out that I got in, they all immediately wanted to voice their opinions because this had to be a family discussion. And my mom, thank God, my mom, she is my biggest fan by far. I know this completely. She literally cut them off at the pass and said, none of you are speaking to him about this. I have already told him that I support this decision. You will not bother him about that. That's awesome. Knowing that my parents both supported me that strongly, it just made it so much easier for me to then be able to say, you know what, it's two or three years of more school. I'm going to do it and I'm going to succeed at this. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it makes such a huge difference. It's hard when it feels like you're swimming upstream. Having that support, that's a game changer. Oh, totally. Yeah. The parents are the hardest. If you have them, then you're okay. Yeah, I know friends in the Asian American Pacific Islander diaspora where the parents are like, absolutely not. You're not doing that. And it's like, God, it's so difficult. It is so difficult. Yeah. It's so hard because you know it comes from a good place, but... Yes, and I've had conversations with my non-Asian friends about the struggles that we go through because it's a huge cultural difference, Western versus Eastern. Yeah. We do things for our family in ways that many Westerners don't even consider. Yeah. And we make these big sacrifices for our families. And the whole sense of we versus I. Yeah. And I thought about this, especially during the pandemic as well. Oh, yeah. With the whole wearing a mask. We yes. do collectively what is best for our community in many different aspects. Yeah. I always felt like our family was a unit. Whatever you do, it affects the whole unit. So you have to get their opinion because it yeah. affects them. Yeah. You don't really necessarily want their opinion. But right. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. I need to do a little more reading into this, but I actually have read through the entire Tao, Tao Te Ching. Uh-huh. And I really do think that there's something behind the Eastern philosophies that are embedded in our cultures. Mm-hmm. Buddhism, Taoism, Zen, that talks about doing what's best for everybody. Working on yourself, but also putting good out into the world. It feels like it's missing from Western philosophies and mm, religions. I was also raised in a Baptist church and I have the scars from that experience as well. But when I go back to the way that my mom raised us as children, and I speak to my friends that are Buddhist, a lot of the teachings are identical. Because my mom's family, on her side of the family, they were Buddhist. And my dad's side, they were Christian. So it creates an interesting cross-section. There is a lot of intersectionality for me between Eastern philosophies and living in the Western world. The thing that always puzzles me is that if you read the Bible, it is very much a collective philosophy, lift up the poor and help the people who need help. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, you should be treated equally. I feel like all the religions have the same values, but somehow America's very good at making it about capitalism. Yep. It's oh, specifically yeah. American Christianity, where mm-hmm. it's just so warped. We are the country of extremes. Yeah. So they've taken this thing and they've gone extreme in that direction. I have many <laughs> thoughts on this. <laughs> I could talk about this for hours. Oh my God. Yeah, we do. <laughs> That's why we started a podcast, because we had so much. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry and I were talking for hours and we're like, wait, no, we need to put this somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a brilliant idea. It is It is a great, amazing idea. If Joe Rogan can have a podcast, then we can start. Oh my God, say- <laughs> for real. And our voices and our stories need to be put out there in general. Yeah, but everything you said about the collectivism and oh my God, the mask, that is still something that annoys me so much that people are still politicizing that. But the idea of doing something slightly inconvenient, and it wasn't even that big of a deal, right. but the idea of doing something that maybe isn't exactly what you want to do for the interest of other people Mm -hmm. was something that was really hard for a lot of Americans to wrap their heads around. And I think that's just a reflection of how individualist our society is. Oh, totally. I still wear my mask. Me too. Me too. Yeah, (laughs) for everything. All of the traveling that I had to do in April and May for auditions and for concerts, 
I wore that mask the entire time. Yeah. Yeah. If it was a 10 a.m. call, I had the mask on from 10 a.m. until the lunch break. I would go outside, eat lunch, and then that mask was on from noon or one until whenever. If I'm on a flight and I'm in the airport, it is on the entire time. Uh, To be honest with you, I don't notice it on my face. Yeah. I would rather know that I am keeping the people around me safe if I am positive for COVID or if an audience member shows up that is immunocompromised and I'm traveling from another state, another city. I want to keep those people safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane that instead of thinking about keeping other people safe, it has turned into what it has turned into. Yeah. It's extremely it's frustrating. So the ableism, too. Maybe you should just be healthy. It's, that's, yeah. Or it's I, just a cold. I think in the Eastern culture, too, there's an element of shame if you brought something bad to the community. Right. If you're responsible for killing your uncle with COVID or something, mm-hmm. that's a bad thing. Nobody wants that. So everybody's like, you know what? I'll wear a mask. No big deal. Yeah. <laughs> but in America, it's the opposite. I went to hang out at this conference this weekend and I was talking to this guy who's immunocompromised and he's like, my doctor told me I need to wear the mask, stay six feet from people. And we're talking and one of his friends comes by not wearing a mask, trying to hug him. And the mm. guy keeps telling him, no, please mm. stay six feet away. I have health issues. And he's like, I have health issues too. And, and I'm like, how do you even talk to people like that? You're telling them, my doctor told me I cannot do this, yeah. and they're imposing themselves on you. How do you even talk to those people? Yeah. Unfortunately, you can't, because the mentality of my opinion is the most valid seems to have become the norm. Yeah. And so that person thinks that their opinion, which is not based in facts, yeah, is the most important thing, and they center it on themselves. Yeah. Regardless of whether it might kill the person they're talking to. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And people say you're taking this to an extreme. I have friends that were hospitalized that have long term COVID symptoms, direct friends. And I have friends who have lost family members. Yeah. So it's not like many of us are untouched from this. No, we are all directly affected. My mom is waiting for a kidney transplant. When she has that kidney transplant, she will be on immunosuppressants for the rest of her life. Why? Do you not want to keep somebody like that safe? Yeah. It's just, it's mind blowing to me. My goals in life are basically put positive whatever out there for people. Keep the people around me safe and just do the right thing. And I get so frustrated when I see people that are so willfully against that. And it's in their ignorance that they are like that. Yeah. 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 It's so hard to watch. Oh, yeah. When it came to the vaccines, too, I remember this was right before we got the Delta wave and I had Mm -hmm. someone trying to get me to hang out with them. And she was like, I'm unvaccinated. She was undecided about the vaccine, which I don't know what there was to decide, but I had gotten both shots and she was like, oh, you're vaccinated now. You can hang out with me. And I don't feel comfortable hanging out with people who are not vaccinated. And she kept insisting that you should be fine because you have the vaccine. So many people don't really understand how science and vaccines work, but just the, my opinion matters more than yours. So I'm Mm -hmm. going to cross your boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries, people. Boundaries. Yeah. People can say no. And what I find also amazing is when you put up hard, fast boundaries, oh my God. They push so hard at those boundaries. And I swear it is because we are the quote unquote model minority. That makes so much sense. We are supposed to be quiet and we are not supposed to make waves. That's part of the reason why, especially on social media, on TikTok, I get so much pushback. I have so many people reporting my content because I should not be speaking out. And I don't even think that they even realize that it is the weaponization of my being quote unquote model minority. They just fall right in line with it. And instead of questioning why it is that they feel compelled to behave in the way that they behave, they just go with it. And yet we are the ones that are portrayed as the sheep for wearing a mask, for wanting to keep the people around us safe. It's mind blowing to me. There were so many instances, and I'm curious if this has been your experience where in the moment you're like, this person's not treating me well. And looking back, it's, oh, it is because we're supposed to be a model minority. It is racially charged in Mm -hmm. some way. 
So I've experienced it here in the States. I will say that because we experience it so often, it's easy for us to see it and pick it out. And for our white friends, it is really hard for them to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've said to friends, that was racist. They're like, really? Why? And so I explain it to them. And they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yes. Because the eight or nine times in the last however many weeks, months, I've experienced a similar situation. That has been the reaction. And when you experience that same situation, you don't get that reaction. Yeah. And they're like, oh, in the Netherlands, I experienced it. Little things. I'm standing at the counter waiting to be served. I see the people behind the counter serving all of the people around me, people walking up, getting served and leaving. And five minutes later, I'm still standing there. And when you are the minority, it is so difficult to actually speak up and say, hey, I'm here. Help me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually remember. (laughs) So in the Netherlands, stroopwafels are a thing. In the markets on the weekends, they will make them fresh, hot, nice sugary syrup put inside. And you go up and they're a euro 50. There was this one particular stand in Utrecht where I always went there until the one lady was helping me. And I said, in Dutch, one fresh stroopwafel, please. And she looks at me, does the whole pause, the racial pause, where they're like, what am I going to do? How am I going to react? And instead of handing me one of the fresh ones that was sitting on the counter right in front of her, she went to the back and got a cold one for me. What? What? Yeah. Oh my God. And a friend of mine that was standing next to me, American, walks up. He was the next one that she helped. He said, in English, I would also like a stroopwafel. And she gave him the one that she had just finished making. Oh my God. Wow. It is blatant. And I actually did ask him, did you notice what she just did? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, I didn't. Yeah. Now, I don't expect people to be that observant. I am overly observant in general, which is why if I see something happening, I will speak up. Yeah. And I don't expect other people to be that way. That is one of the things in my personality. And thankfully, he was like, what the F? That is unacceptable. I was like, come on, let's keep walking. Let's just get, because I, building awareness is one thing, and but we have to pick our battles, unfortunately. And, and I spoke with my brother about this. Like when we're out and about, especially during the pandemic, people shoot us glances. Do you say anything? With my brother, I was asking him about this and he was like, nope, I usually don't say anything because I don't know if any of the other white people around are going to then jump on me because I'm saying something to this other white person. Yeah. yeah. At the very start of the pandemic, the day that things started to shut down, I was in Princeton for a gig. A friend of mine and I were at the grocery store on our dinner break. We walked in, we were looking at things. She turns her back and is looking at a drink or whatever because we're trying to get dinner. This white lady is pushing her cart. She walks through towards me. It dawns on her that I am standing in front of her and I kid you not, she goes, (gasps) covers her mouth, turns around and literally runs in the opposite direction. Oh my God. Now, I'm not a skinny person. I am broad-shouldered. I am a t- like 5'10", 5'9". So usually people don't physically try to do anything to me. But when she did that, I actually laughed out loud. And my friend turns around and she says, wait, what happened? And I told her, she's British. Her back got up and she was like, who was it? Where, who do I need to beat up? Let me... <laughs> What the hell? That's not acceptable. And she was ready to go at it for me. And we need everybody to behave in that way, to know that we actually have safe people around us, because otherwise it is extremely difficult for us to speak up. Yeah. And everybody reacts differently. When the adrenaline is pumping, the fight or flight instinct is very strong. And I will say that I also get to the point where I want to exit the situation. But I know that there are people that really cannot say anything. And I know that I can. So there are many times when I push that feeling down and I just open my mouth and say what needs to be said. Because I know that there are people that can't or are in situations where it is unsafe for them to do that. And knowing that there are other people that are speaking out and that they are not singular in those feelings and experiences is so important. Because if we feel like we are the only ones feeling that way, nobody will speak out. Yeah. And we're never singular in our feelings or experiences. 
it's crazy too in america i did not grow up in america so the whole gun thing is blows my mind yeah yeah at the start of covid when i started seeing all those stories about asian people being attacked i just made a decision okay first of all i'm not gonna go out <laughs> second when i do have to go out hopefully the mask and a hat and sunglasses will make it harder for them to notice that i'm asian yes and mm -hmm. if they do notice that i'm asian and they do something i'm just gonna run away because they might have guns <laughs> right yes so, and it is not worth picking that battle if you right. don't know the person right for example like with your friend where they asked you oh, how was that racist? And then you explained it to them that I would be comfortable doing because I know the person and it's unlikely that they're just gonna draw a gun and kill me. Yeah, but right. With random strangers, I don't know if it's worth it. Yeah, no, yeah. it's I, I, no, it's not. And we've all seen the attacks that have happened on the East Coast, on the West Coast, the people that have been pushed in front yeah. of, you yeah. know, I use public transport here. Yeah. I will tell you when I'm on that subway platform, I stand against the wall. Yeah. I don't let people walk behind me anymore. Mm -hmm. And if I see other Asians, especially our elderly community, I will position myself next to them. Because if something happens to them and I'm there, I would not be able to forgive myself if I weren't standing there to help. Yeah. Yeah. I, on Friday, I went to have lunch with one of my neighbors. We were on the subway. There was an elderly couple sitting behind us, and I didn't realize that they were there. But then there was an elderly gentleman that got on, and he had a walker. I started to stand up, and he put his hand on my shoulder and got me to sit down. But when we were getting out of the train, he had a moment of unbalance. And I just made sure to put myself right behind him so that I could keep him from falling backwards. Everybody else around just stood there. Yeah. My first instincts are always to help in whatever way that I can. That's just who I am. I just always make sure that I'm aware of my surroundings. And especially now, I'm hyper aware of my surroundings because yeah. we don't know when the next one will happen. And unfortunately, you have to be of the mindset that it is not if it will happen around you, it is when it will happen around you. Yeah. And we have to be ready for that. Yeah, in our episode with CC last week, we were talking about, you know, to be a good ally, we have to mentally prepare for those situations. We have to think through, okay, if this situation happens, what can I do? What should I do? What's the safest way to de-escalate the situation or to help without mm -hmm. making things worse? And a lot of times when that happens and you're not prepared, people freeze. Maybe there's people who want to help, but in the moment, their brain just went I'm out. <laughs> yeah. And I've also felt that when things were happening to me, where in the moment I was shocked and I was angry and I knew that something wasn't right, but I couldn't articulate it. I couldn't speak up for myself. And then I would kick myself. Why didn't I say anything? So we have to prepare ourselves ahead of time and think about what could happen and what could we do to yeah. help. Yeah. There is an author that I've actually become friends with on TikTok. I saw some of her content dealing with aggressive men and how to react being a woman. Her name is Eliza Van Court. She has a book. It's on the New York Times bestseller list right now. It's called Claiming Spaces. I'm slowly making my way through her book. It is fantastic and it gives you scenarios in which you can then read through and say, yes, that is an experience that I've had. This is actually a good way to handle this situation because it's important that we are prepared for that thing. I mean, as performers, we practice the music that we are going to perform so that when we are in stressful situations, the muscle memory takes over and we just do it. And for any kind of activism, for any kind of safety response, we have to practice and rehearse those things. Whether it's in our heads, we say it out loud, we write it down. We have to practice those things so that when we are in the stressful situation, that muscle memory takes over and it just happens. Yeah. And I think sometimes we forget that. Yeah. yeah. Just like first aid, right? You need to train. It's the same, but mentally. Totally. Uh, the book sounds great. I'm going to look that up. I think a lot of people don't view activism that way as a practice that you do regularly. The same way you practice a skill, any mm -hmm. kind of skill. Yeah. Allyship is and it's an action. And I think a lot of people think of it more as a label rather than an action. Just say, oh, I'm not a bigot. I'm not a racist. I'm an ally. But they don't realize that requires action and like, yeah. it requires regular action and it's a yes. habit. Yeah. And your silence makes you culpable in the thing that you were silent about. 
Yeah. yeah. Silence helps the oppressor. Yes. On the subject of ally, what makes an ally? What makes an ally? Somebody who is supportive of you, who speaks out for you when it is necessary, but who also listens and doesn't try to victim blame if you are the target. There are so many people that say that they are allies. And if that's the case, that is great. But if you are not actively supporting your friend and speaking up if things happen, what kind of ally are you really? Yeah, I will support my friends in any way that I can. And I also ask them, what can I do for you? And a lot of my support, especially on TikTok, they will reach out to me and say, how can I help you? How can I support you? That is a true ally. Yeah. Because if they yeah. recognize that you you are in pain or you are in need, they will then ask. And for me, if you keep doing what you are doing and we keep supporting each other, that is all that I need yeah. at this point. And everything on TikTok, it's just an app. So the things that we deal with in real life are so much more real than the stupid trolls and idiot comments that we get on social media. And yeah. I don't think that those people understand. We are actually much stronger than that because we deal with this our entire lives in the world yeah and they don't get that because they've never had to deal with it yeah one other thing i wanted to touch on is in the lgbtq community do you feel othered yes all the time all the time yeah i know you have opinions about that so expand on it <laughs> This goes back as far as when I first came out. It was my senior year of high school. The racism that I experienced in the LGBTQIA plus community, I honestly thought that it was my own singular experience. And so I didn't really ascribe the word racism to it until I was a little older. But this was in the days of gay.com. I don't even know if that website still exists, but I'm not one to go to clubs. So I had an online profile. And as I started reading other people's profiles, the holy trinity of the gay profile in the 90s and early 2000s was no fats, no femmes, no Asians. What? So if you are going to respond to somebody or send them a message, you can't be fat. So fat phobia, no femmes, so no feminine men and no Asians. They would not communicate with an Asian person. And that has been my entire out life. Wow. And the numbers of times that I've been told you're not white enough to date. Oh, I don't date Asians. It's just my preference. Oh, God. But then they won't even communicate or speak to me. One of my first times ever admitting to somebody that I had feelings for them was somebody that I knew in real life. We were in biochemistry together. And he said, oh, as you can see, I only date people that look like me, Eastern European or redhead. Oh, my God. What? Yeah. And this person is 6'2". He's kind of muscly. He's a healthcare professional now. Yikes. That type of behavior I have experienced my entire life. When I moved to Philadelphia, one gay guy that was a co-worker of mine in the pharmacy actually said to a friend who asked him, would you ever date an Asian person? Without skipping a beat, he said, ew, no, they smell bad. Oh my. I looked at him and I said, so you think I smell bad? Oh, no, you know what I mean. No. What does he mean? <laughs> no, I don't know what you mean. Because your words were, I would never date an Asian. They smell bad. Yeah. So what do you mean? You are racist. Don't call me that. The words that you just said, you categorize an entire half of the globe and said that we all smell bad. And guess what? AABBC11, the gene that expresses powdery earwax, also expresses less bodily odor. I can go run a 10 mile race. I did the Philadelphia Broad Street run before I moved to the Netherlands. Got done with the run, you would not be able to tell that I just ran 10 miles. Yeah. Being othered in the LGBTQIA plus community, it runs rampant. And if it's not that, it is every now and then, once in every three blue moons, a certain gay male of a certain age will reach out and their comment is, or their first message is, I love Chinese. Ugh. And my response is, that's great. I'm Texan. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great for you. 
I am from Texas. If you think that I'm going to behave like your stereotype of an Asian, which is the model minority, where we keep our mouths shut and we are subservient to you, here's the finger. You can sit and spin. I'm not (laughs) responding to you. Yeah. Yeah. So being othered and being fetishized in the LGBTQIA community, it runs rampant. And I've spoken to other ethnic groups within the LGBTQI community, and they experience a similar thing. And for the longest time, it was unspoken. I had friends, I would tell them, gays are so racist. I would tell them these stories. And I would be told from my white gay friends, Edmund, that's not racist. You're just sensitive. What? Being too sensitive. Uh, Gaslighting. Yeah, over and over and over again. Maybe six or seven years ago, an article came out. And of course, it didn't get much traction. But an article came out basically of a bunch of Asian gays that were saying, this is what we've experienced, the racism within the community and the fetishization that we've experienced. And I read it and I was like, thank God. God, I'm not the only one. And I just became more vocal about it. (laughs) I honestly, I sometimes have to control it because I get really passionate about it. I think what happened to me with social media during Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and now what's happening during Pride Month, they've poked the activist dragon within me. (laughs) I am screaming to the world, you all need to sit down and listen for real. I actually had a troll on TikTok say, why are you wearing green nail polish? That's so girly. Nail polish comes from China, from 3000 BC. So it is 5,000 years old. It was used by the ruling class, the upper class. They were allowed to use dark, intense colors and gold and silver on their nails. If you were a commoner and you were seen with nail polish, your nail stained, they might possibly chop your hand off. Oh my God. Because it was not allowed. So if you think that my wearing nail polish is girly, here it is again, and you can sit and spin. It's a part of my cultural heritage, and it was then spread to the world. But if you're not willing to learn and you're not flexible enough to change your mindset on things, you get stuck. And I feel like there's just so many people that are stuck. And it's so easy because online, they can always find something that will confirm their biases. Oh, totally. And then that fuels them to come onto your page and just harass you yeah sometimes the internet you can find anything to confirm your bias the correct information's out there but yeah. it's not getting to people who need it yeah and i feel like the way that our education system in the united states has gone it's doing a disservice to the people that are being educated in it because instead of inspiring people to be curious and actually find the facts and really learn something It is teaching young people to just accept what they are told. And to have strong opinions about it. And that their opinion is the most important. Yeah. It seems like the stronger opinion you have, the more correct you are. Yes. Yes. That is it in a nutshell. Oh, gosh. Yeah, where I grew up, which is a tiny island called Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, everybody came from somewhere. There was no native people. We were all brought there by the Dutch, the French, the British. So most of the population is from India, about 2% from China, and then the rest are mostly slaves that they brought from Africa, various parts of Africa. But when I was in school, one of the things we had to learn was all the different ethnic groups, which gods they pray to, what their religions were, what their major celebrations were, what rituals they would perform, what foods they would have. And we were really encouraged to know those things. And we actually got tested. Do you know what gods they pray to? And so I felt like that was a really good thing to do. Yeah. When my parents went to school, that was not a thing yet. So when I learned it, I would bring it home and I would tell my parents about it. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that was what that festival was about or whatever. Yeah. And then in the country, every religion had one public holiday. Oh, cool. The Hindus had, I think, two. They were a little special because they have all the power. But I digress. (laughs) Uh, We had, I think, Christmas was a holiday, and then Chinese people had Chinese New Year off. Yeah, so like every religion that was big there what had their own holiday we all get the day off. We all celebrate. For Chinese New Year, would bring the cakes and share with our friends and. Our Hindu friends would bring Diwali cakes for us. Oh, cool. Yeah. So 
I really wish that the U.S. would do that. But yeah. at the same time, I understand that the U.S. is a much bigger country and there's way more religions. And if you mm -hmm. gave everybody a holiday, then we wouldn't work at all. Yeah, but I think that the big message there is that we just need to be open to learning about it all. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just that little bit of learning. When we were six, seven years old, I felt like that helped us connect and understand other people's cultures a little bit better and encouraged us to be like, oh, okay, we just celebrate different things. And we believe yeah. different things and that's right. fine we're friends whereas here i feel like the people who grew up in a very christian community when they meet somebody who is not from a christian community it's such a big deal for us it was oh yeah those people believe in islam and those people believe in hinduism and we're buddhist catholics yeah okay. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it was yeah. not a big deal. Also, religion was not really a thing in politics as it is here. Yeah. The whole idea of separation of church and state, the line has been blurred. And there is no separation of church and state anymore. No, no, anymore. No. And That's I ridiculous. actually think that it started when, and this will date me, <laughs> commercials used to never mention the competitor's name until the one year that Coke or Pepsi, I can't remember which one it was, mentioned the other brand. And it was a huge deal. But because that practice was allowed, that door was thrown wide open and we started this tumble down this path. And I'm sure people will argue with me about this. Luckily, it's a podcast, so they can't. <laughs> <laughs> But I feel like at that point, the separation of church and state, I, we were already headed in that direction anyways, and that just opened the door and things have been swiftly tumbling down in that direction. Yeah. And it all comes back to education, at least in my opinion. Education and listening skills. I feel like listening skills are such an mm. underrated skill. Oh, yes. Yes, I agree. Most people listen to respond rather than to understand. Yeah. yeah. I took a communications course in my computer science degree. We had a mm -hmm. communications for computer scientists because we mm. do not have communication skills. But anyway, in that course, she taught us that most of us listen to respond, listen to argue. And she said, that is not how you listen. And we mm -hmm. had to learn active listening. And I learned so much from that course. Didn't mm. realize at the time how much of an impact that would have on my life. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm like, I wish everybody took that course to graduate yeah. high school. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually thinking to myself, I should look into some kind of course like that to take now as an adult. And especially as a musician, we listen and respond. And I feel like the good musicians really know how to listen for the sake of listening. And that teaches them so much about what they are doing, the music that they are performing. And then after that, when they respond musically, it adds to that creation. And I, yeah, I need to go look into communications classes. Yeah, I wish high schools would do that because it's such an important skill that few people have. It's a yeah. life skill that needs to be taught. <laughs> yeah. So what do you think the AAPI community could do better? I think that the AAPI community, we need to speak out more. We need to tell our stories more often. We already band together as a community. I love that. I think the big thing is to speak out and to make sure that we are not lost in the shuffle because so often we are lost in the shuffle. Yeah, and that's a big cultural shift too for us. We are so taught to keep our head down, don't let it bother you, just keep going. Work harder. Work harder. And also, culturally, we're not politically active. That, I think, needs to change. Yeah, that's a good point. And that actually also falls into the whole don't create waves. Yeah. Because what creates waves in America more than talking about politics? Yeah. But even if you don't talk, go vote. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. Everybody needs to go vote. If the AAPI community is not voting, go vote. Yeah. It's so yeah. important. We didn't even have the right to vote for a really long time. Mm. So it wasn't until was it 52, I think. Is right? that right? Yeah. I was thinking 61. <laughs> what is something that the LGBTQ community should be doing better? They need to uplift the voices of the non-white LGBTQIA plus community. And in that vein, do you want to talk about Pride in Every Color? Yes, I would love to. <laughs> Did you see any of the Pride out? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I, maybe I shouldn't talk too much about that. But I personally felt the erasure of the AAPI community within the larger LGBTQIA plus community because of that. And then... 
I noticed their co-opting of the missing and murdered Indigenous women in the Two-Spirit hand sign. And those two things combined together, I spoke out a lot. And my presence on TikTok has blown up because of that. But even if this hadn't happened, I would have been speaking up anyways. My friend on TikTok, Soul Assassin, and I, we were talking with one of our other friends. I'd had numerous people reaching out to me saying, thank you so much for saying what you were saying. We're so sorry that they are actually attacking your account. Maybe we should band together and do something on our own, which I had already been thinking to myself. I have to celebrate Pride in my way this year because I was so excited for the inclusion of our voices in this. And to be let down like that was so disappointing. And so my friend Soul Assassin and I, we went through the hashtags that are available for Pride, and Pride in every color hadn't been used by any group yet. So we said, that's it. And we want this to be all inclusive, but we also want to focus on boosting and uplifting the presence of Black, Indigenous, Two-Spirit, other people of color, disabled within our community, because our voices are always lost in the shuffle, not represented, and pride has turned into a money-making scheme. Yeah. And it all started because of a trans Black woman. Yeah. And we have to remember that and give credit to strong Black women who have stood up for all of us. They've stood up for their rights. And because of that, we all have our rights as well. And then the Indigenous community and the Two-Spirit community are instantly left out. Yeah. The Asian community, the Pacific Islander community, the Middle Eastern community, we are all consistently left out of pride. And enough. I'm done with that idea, which is why we started this. We've been talking about trying to further this into something bigger than just something on TikTok, because it it feels like there are so many people that have found a larger sense of community because of this. And in the end, that is what I want, because that is also what I never had before. Yeah, so we've been working really hard. I have to set up boundaries for myself as well as far as how much I interact with what's going on on TikTok and how much I'm actually doing for myself in real life because the first two days of Pride were miserable for me and then when we started Pride in Every Color it just blew up and that first week of Pride it it consumed the entire week for me and I realized I'm missing meals, I'm not practicing, there are other things in my daily life that I have to be doing as well. So right now it's trying to find the balance but soul assassin and i are also looking into other ways to make this more than just this one little thing that we're doing right now because i've had people reach out and say I love this so much. I wish this was all year. I feel like I actually am represented now. I feel like I'm a part of a community. I've had so many people reaching out saying that. And that's important for us. (laughs) Truth be told, last month I had also thought to myself, how can I do this? And I have looked up articles on how to start a podcast. So I can help you. Okay, maybe we should. Yeah, we should definitely talk about this too. I can show you all the tricks. Honestly, we decided on April. April 27th that we were going to put our first podcast out May 1st for eight. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> Yay. That's so exciting. I'm happy to show you all I know. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Yeah. That would be great. Okay. Before we wrap that section up, I know one of the critiques that you've had on TikTok was what about the white LGBTQ? Mm-hmm. So for the people who are in the back, what's the difference between excluding white people and mm-hmm highlighting people of color more than white people. Let's make that distinction because I think a lot of time they get defensive about, oh, what about us? As far as excluding versus including, we are boosting our Black, Indigenous, Two-Spirit, other people of color, disabled voices. And everybody is encouraged to interact, to comment, to give us their answers to questions. They can do wet, they can stitch. All representation is important. But for instance, if you look at Asian creators on TikTok, our followings are very small in comparison to white creators because these social media apps are set up to suppress 
non-white content creators. There have been articles written on this. Before I found out about those articles, I actually did question, why is it that my Instagram account after seven years only has 1,100 people? And there was a point at which I was constantly posting food pictures, music pictures, videos of me playing, and I would see 20 views. Yeah. And I would see other white creators basically, and I'm just going to say it, sawing away at the violin. 15,000 views. 15,000 views. You are too good. The quest for mediocrity is just, it's astounding. But that is, there is a big difference in how our content is treated. Yeah versus how a white person's content is treated. And for the people that are listening that are white and that are getting upset by my saying that, you have to stop and question and reflect, why am I upset? Am I upset because what he is saying is hitting close to home? Or am I upset because what he is saying is not true? Because those are different things. But everybody, they just get upset and they lash out without actually reflecting on why. And there's also a distinction between it feels like it's not true and it's actually not true. Yes, correct. So go fact check. Yes. And don't fact check by Googling the question that confirms your bias. Fact check by Googling the opposite and see mm -hmm. what the opposite opinion is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why I love that I have met up with so many Black creators, Indigenous creators, Two-Spirit creators, other people of color creators, because in opening up the dialogue with all of our communities, I'm a biochemistry major. I understand the whole confirmation bias, data manipulation. I mm -hmm. get all of that. I want to know what people are truly experiencing. Yeah. I actually had somebody reach out to me and say, I love this concept. I cannot participate because there are certain people in that I see that I do not feel safe with. And I said, I totally understand that. Can we have a conversation as to why? Because I want to understand why that is. Yeah. And we did. And I totally understand that person's perspective. I get it. Yeah. yeah. Can you think of an example that we can leave our listeners with that illustrate why it's so important to have those conversations and to uplift those stories because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. If you live in ignorance, it is a choice. And I've had friends on the app see my stories mm -hmm. and whether it's food, music, my experiences in the LGBTQIA plus community. And they've said, oh my God, I've seen that happen to somebody else. It never even occurred to me that would be something racist. Thank you for actually showing me this and telling me about this. So it is very important that our voices and our stories and experiences are a part of the conversation yeah. because mm -hmm. history has shown us that when groups are oppressed and nobody speaks out, really horrible things happen. We need those stories so that we can find our blind spots because we all have them. Yeah. We are a product of the environment we grew up in. And if we want to call ourselves allies, then we want to be able to identify those blind spots and correct them. Yeah. And I always encourage people, if you see me doing something questionable, please bring it to my attention. Yeah. Because yeah. I also need to learn. We all have work to do all of yeah. us none of us are immune to that we all have work to do and we need and to support okay. each other yeah. right and being okay with being held accountable being okay mm -hmm. with the initial discomfort of oh i did something wrong knowing that you're yeah. gonna make mistake it's better for me to make mistakes and learn how to correct them than not do anything at all and just help the system get worse yeah. by just being silent if right? you are truly wanting to learn get comfortable making mistakes <laughs> yeah that's like learning anything yeah. You can't just pick up a violin and sound great. You're just going to sound awful for years. Before you sound oh, yeah. Yeah. My students, I have two adult students. Anytime they make a bobble and they cringe and stop, I actually do tell them it's totally fine. Just keep going because you will make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. Yeah. yeah. What is there's the quote like the key to being good at anything is to first be OK with being bad at it. Something yes. To that yes. Effect. I've heard that. And it's yeah. very true. <laughs> Yeah. Be comfortable being bad at it and also wanting to improve. 
yeah be better it is always about the journey never about the destination it's always about the process never about the goal it should always be about the betterment of who you are in the larger sense and never about the attainment of whatever it is at the end yeah because if you are only focused on that you miss so much that's happening around you in the moment yeah Absolutely. All right. To round up the interview, we're going to give you some rapid fire questions. These are just oh God. one word or one phrase answers. You don't have to explain, but you okay. can if you want. Okay. All right. What's an Asian food that you should like, but don't? The dried fishes. What's an Asian food that you'll never get tired of? Oh, my mom's cooking, but <laughs> noodles of any kind. <laughs> what language do you speak with your parents? English. Your favorite Baroque outfit you've performed in? Oh, the historical clothing that I had made for me. Oh, cool. <laughs> it's, I only have the one set. <laughs> it's so expensive. Favorite piece to perform? Oh, the Rebel Sonata that I have on my YouTube channel. We'll put a link to it. Okay, yeah. That, it, that is, I used to not have a favorite. That is my favorite sonata. I, it is. And finally, most overplayed piece. God, classical? Canon and D. For real. Actually, I performed that piece with Austin Baroque Orchestra last April for a video. It is on their YouTube channel. That is the first time I have ever performed it professionally, and we did it the historical performance way. So it's not your standard Canon and D. It's so much more fun that way. I'll send you the link to that. Not to toot my own horn, it is a beautiful performance, and my friends and colleagues in that group deserve recognition for that. Yeah, too, we'd love so. to see it. Send us that and send us the other one from your YouTube channel and we'll put those in the show notes so people can go. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm excited to see them. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Yeah. Before we let you go, do you want to let our listeners know how they can get in touch with you, how they can find you on the socials? Sure. I don't have a website up yet, but on Instagram, it is Baroque Violin Foodie, B-R-Q-V-L-N-F-O-D-I-E. I have the same handle on TikTok. Be warned, I do speak my mind. <laughs> we That's love what it. we love. And finally, how can our listeners support Pride in Every Color? Just go to our TikTok account. You can follow that account, duet stitch questions. We have story times. We have history. So just interact and engage. That would be great. If you search Pride in Every Color, I believe my account shows up. Soul Assassin, her account will show up as well. She deserves a lot of credit for this. She works so hard and has been such a great and amazing friend and supporter. So big shout out to her as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for spending the time with us today. It was great having you on. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. (laughs) Yeah, this was fun. Here are our takeaways for today's episode. Number one, speaking up for yourself gets exhausting, but having the ability to do so safely is a privilege that not everyone has. Number two, for those who can't speak up, just hearing other people speak up validates their experiences and helps make voices like theirs matter. Number three, If you want to help protect our elderly Asian community, you can position yourself near them so that you can easily intervene if need be. Number four, being an ally is not a label, it's a habit and an action. Just as musicians practice so that in stressful situations our muscle memory takes over, we have to practice so that we have muscle memory to act like an ally. And number five, it's important for every movement and community to be inclusive. Pride in Every Color was created specifically to amplify the voices of BIPOC, Two-Spirit, and disabled creators within the LGBTQIA plus community. Within a movement, it's important to actively uplift the voices of those that typically get even further marginalized. And that's it for today. If you know someone who would enjoy this episode, we hope you'll share it with them and build on our show to have your own nuanced conversations about the relationships we have with our cultural identities and how they affect us. Tune in next week for another nuanced conversation.